In 2006, Atlas Core was founded to address critical social issues by developing leaders, strengthening organizations, and promoting innovations through an overseas fellowship and virtual learning programs of skilled professionals from around the world. Our community began with an inaugural class of six fellows who hailed from Colombia and India. In 15 years, Atlas Core has empowered 1,000 leaders from 104 countries, partnered with 300 host organizations, U.S. embassies, and our network of supporters to multiply impact domestically and worldwide. Atlas Core leaders represent the richness of diversity, inclusion, and cultural awareness. Now, more than ever, we need to keep building bridges between social change leaders from around the world. During our 15th anniversary year, Atlas Core continues to engage social change leaders as fellows and virtual scholars. Our fellows serve in the United States and virtually from their home regions. Virtual scholars enhance their professional skills, build global networks, and prepare for leadership in home communities during our Virtual Leadership Institute, a new online leadership development program launched by Atlas Core in 2020. This year, we invite you to celebrate with us our 15th anniversary. Thank you for supporting our community of global change makers. Thank you for supporting Atlas Core. Hey, uh, my name is uh, Zachary Morris, and I am the Senior Manager of Global Engagement at Atlas Core. I'm also here with two of our Atlas Core fellows, Elvira and Karam, and we're going to tell you about Atlas Core and give you tips for being a successful candidate for the fellowship. First, a little bit about Atlas Core. Atlas Core engages leaders committed to social change and impact in 12 to 18 month professional fellowships at organizations to learn best practices, build organizational capacity, and return to create a network of global change makers. Fellows serve full time at host organizations in the United States addressing issues that complement their expertise. They're increasing their leadership skills through hands-on experience while developing invaluable connections to learn effective practices. The fellowship is open to people worldwide who are not currently living in the United States. And um, they must have at least a bachelor's degree, two years of experience, and are 35 years or younger. I also wanted to tell you about our special focus for 2021 and early 2022 fellowships. We're currently prioritizing applicants who have skill sets where there is strong demand. These leaders should have at least two years of full-time experience in communications and marketing, partnership building and business development, monitoring and evaluation and data analysis or technology and engineering. If your experience falls outside of these skill sets, don't worry, um, you can still go ahead and apply. Um, all of our opportunities you can find at apply.atlascore.org, which you see here on the bottom of the screen. Um, the full list of skill areas can also be found on our website. This webinar is going to highlight our fellows and alumni whose fellowship focused on tech and engineering roles. As a fellow in technology and engineering, you could be engineering products such as websites, platforms, applications to support mission-driven work or maintaining systems and training teams in information technology. We have a page that also highlights our opportunities in technology and engineering, which you'll be able to find when you go to our website. Um, feel free to put any of the questions that you have in the chat um, and comments, and we will respond to you at the end. Um, now you'll hear from fellows who will speak about their experience in technology and engineering roles during the fellowship. Um, so I am gonna go ahead and give a really warm welcome to Elvira and uh, Karam, who we have here on the line. <laughs> uh, welcome. Um, I'd love to start off with uh, the five facts <laughs> um, for each of you. Um, so Elvira would love to hear uh, from you. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Zach. I am so excited to be here and uh, 
definitely looking forward to interacting with everyone at this session. So my name is Alvira, as Zach has um, earlier mentioned, and I am an Atlas Co Fellow from Kenya. I am serving at Pascola's in New York. And um, a social issue I am passionate about is um, education and public schools. And uh, one of my favorite things to do is uh, playing tennis and making anonymous donations. Amazing. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your, your five facts. Uh, Karab, uh, love to hear from you to introduce yourself to our audience here today. To share oh. my, okay. uh, I'm, I'm excited today to share my experience with Atlas Core and Microsoft. My uh, five facts say, my name is Karam, Karam Yakba. I'm, uh, an, I'm an Atlas Core fellow from Palestine. I served at Microsoft. Uh, a social issue I'm passionate about is digital inclusion. And my fun fact is uh, a lot of people I, I meet has the same birthday. Ooh, amazing. <laughs> awesome. Well, you must have a very, you were born on a very popular day. <laughs> uh, perfect. Well, thank you both for introducing yourselves. Uh, my first question for you is what were you doing before the fellowship and what made you decide to apply to Atlas Core? Um, and Alvira, I'll go ahead and start with you. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you, Zach. So uh, before the fellowship, I was a research and development officer at the Center for Mathematics, uh, Science and Education Technology in Africa, in Nairobi, Kenya. And um, it's a role I took right after graduation. So after, you know, working in that capacity for two years, I felt I was uh, ready for the next chapter, which is Tech intense and Atlas Core was a random chance, honestly, but it sounded interesting enough to pursue. So far, no regrets. Awesome. Uh, for, well, thank you. Thank you for giving us insight into your background. For me, I was working as a full stack developer, .NET, uh, especially, uh, and I worked as uh, an, uh, a mobile developer for both platform iOS and Android for like more than seven years then uh, when you uh, work with the same field for seven years you get stuck and you you want to move uh, or to take a, another adventure and i was in a meeting and i was complaining about how i stuck in my field and when uh, a friend of a friend suggested to apply to atlas Core, actually that was random uh, as a liberal Awesome. A friend of a friend. That's how a lot of people hear about Atlas Core through their word of mouth. Um, amazing. Well, thank, thank you. Um, now, Karam, what was your role at your host organization? Um, and if you could give us insight into what types of technology and engineering activities you did uh, during your service. Um, my role was supposed to be a, a cloud solution architect, and I was a cloud solution architect. I helped uh, some of uh, Airband uh, or Microsoft partners uh, to, to overcome their uh, their challenges by using Microsoft technology and Azure. Uh, also, I, I worked with Microsoft partners to develop uh, proof of concepts to solve their challenges as well. Awesome. Uh, how about you, um, Alvira? <laughs> So I am a blended learning associate at Best Scholars, and uh, I am directly aligned to the software engineering department. So when I came in, my deliverables was to help them um, pilot and roll out a blended learning model for software engineering course. And this means uh, a mixture of in-person and remote learning. And uh, so I recommend the required software, hardware methodology, and monitoring. So for those people who are not familiar with the term, uh, you know, the blended learning, I align technology selection with uh, pedagogical goals. 
and uh, incorporate just supplemental technology to increase student engagement, um, create or advice on instructional screencasts uh, and videos to enhance student interest. And um, this takes place on many learning platforms, but I currently work with Canvas Learning uh, management systems and uh, of course away from all that my other responsibility is to teach the software engineering class or revise content or just manage the learning uh, platform and uh, mm -hmm. did i finish everything oh you also asked about the technologies right yeah mm -hmm. yes yeah, so there are a number of tech activities that i completed of course and um i enjoyed the you know customer relationship management software the most salesforce because of the data analytics bits and uh you know as i mentioned earlier canvas so and it's also been interesting because i also got to do a bit of engineering and so i worked on um, a small gadget called raspberry pi and uh, this was to help uh, the software engineering class to, you know, do like multitask code and as well as listen to the instructor. Because if you're a programmer, you understand that it's very difficult to uh, watch someone do something and at the same time, you know, type the code down. So, yeah, that was interesting. Doing the documentation for it and just enabling everyone, you know, nationwide and the students to use the device. Wow, that's that's really cool. Um, it it seems like you've had a mix of experiences, you know, working with this software, um, and you know, with just the blended learning piece. Uh, thanks so much for giving us insight into what you've been doing during your fellowship. Um, perfect. Well, my next question is, what is one professional accomplishment you're proud of from your fellowship? Um, Karam, love to hear from you. <laughs> I helped uh, a startup called Ikitabu in, in Kenya to automate their server deployment. Uh, let me talk first, let me talk about Airband Initiative and Ikitabu. Airband Initiative is uh, a small uh, or a team in Microsoft help internet service providers to uh, provide internet for rural areas in, in USA and around the world. Uh, and Ikitabu is uh, an organization help uh, schools and libraries in in Kenya to deliver free ebooks for for children to uh, enhance learning. So uh, what I did is to to make the uh, deployment of their server to expand their uh, reach in Kenya and outside Kenya. Very cool. And what do you mean um, by, uh, you know, expanding their reach? I'd love if you could explain a little bit more about that. Uh, uh, now they, they have some uh, some work in Rwanda and different uh, different African countries as well. Uh, the, the reach of uh, of child, of uh, the population of children because they started in Nairobi and they're moving uh, uh, around the uh, uh, counties around Nairobi as well. Oh, amazing. All right. Uh, well, perfect. Having that, you know, international reach while while um, serving with Microsoft. That's great to hear. Um, perfect. And then Elvira, how about you? What's your, you know, one professional accomplishment you're proud of? <laughs> I, <laughs> there is such a tricky question, Zach, but let's see. <laughs> I mean, I am generally proud of all my accomplishments from the minor to major stuff because they involved uh, developing or implementing new procedures or systems, and it was always exciting. And I mean, you know, during all these uh, processes, activities, I still picked up new skills like project management, reporting, and all, you know, improving my leadership ability, because I have been on three national projects. So um, I really can't choose, but one of uh, the, the striking projects that you know has been the talk of the organization is um, an onboarding course for tech instructors. So what the course does is it gives the instructors um, soft skills to enable them 
um, teach tech to adults, especially in remote environments, because um, we realize that many people are facing challenges, whether it's as simple as, you know, maybe setting up the Zoom calls or just troubleshooting. Sometimes uh, an error, for example, in, you know, a student's code. So when they go through this course, it prepares them better for what to expect and to just be able to become more efficient or rather effective in their processes in class. So it was interesting because it was very intense and it happened within like seven months. Um, but yeah, that is what I can say. I like talking the most about. <laughs> Oh, that, that's amazing to hear. And you said um, in remote areas, um, where, where exactly? Sorry, like remote environment. So like right now people are working remotely. So sometimes uh, when a, an instructor, for example, a software engineering instructor is teaching, a student will tell you, uh, hey, I'm unable to install a certain software. And uh, sometimes it can be challenging for you to figure out um, how to help this student. So by taking this course, it prepares you for possible scenarios of uh, some of the you know challenges you might experience in a remote class and uh, how you deal with them. Uh, it also blends down to soft skills like emotional intelligence, what you should do when a student you know uh, gets out of hand or when you're also having a body as an instructor, you know, just to have everything uh, in place like. Prepare you just for everything and anything. Well, great. Um, well, well, you know, so insightful to hear about your professional experiences during your fellowship. And I think a common theme that I'm hearing that I think that is a really important aspect of, of Atlas Core is the social impact that they're, you're having and reach, whether it be, you know, in the United States or, um, you know, with an organization um, in Kenya <laughs> across the world. Um, this whole idea of tech for good, um, which I, I think that that Atlas Core is perfect for as an opportunity and, and what we try to achieve um, through this fellowship. And it's just great to hear, you know, examples of you having done that. Um, Perfect. Well, then my next question is, how did you grow as a professional uh, because of the fellowship experience? What is there is new software uh, you learned or professional skill set that you further developed within technology and engineering as a result of, of it? For, for me, I didn't know anything about cloud before I joined uh, my, my Atlas Core and Microsoft. And this really encourage everyone to apply. It's like it, you shouldn't have all the uh, the boxes checked to apply. You can apply, and you will get accepted. I, I worked at, also with uh, machine learning. I didn't work with machine learning before, and I helped some uh, partners with uh, to, uh, with machine learning and provide some solutions to their businesses using machine learning. Um, I did, the other things I benefit from different than technology is I, I looked at the big tech companies as a, a money sucking machines before I joined Microsoft. And what I learned they have a social impact is that they have a huge social impact around, not in the US, around the world. And one of the a moment I, uh, I keep memory is when they show when they showed a, a video of a woman in, in Kenya who was using a, a, a technology provided by Microsoft and, the, and their partners, they increased her income by tenfolds, and now she she has a, a big part of her society to provide uh, food for her family and, uh, and like a success story for her community as well. Wow, that's amazing to hear and, and interesting. <laughs> your, your sort of perspective of like what your host organization looked like um, before going in and, and kind of that that learning experience, uh, which, you know, in some ways has nothing to do with tech and engineering. <laughs> I mean, Karam, what 
So what background did you have then before the fellowship? It, it sounds like the cloud architecture and the machine learning was like a new area uh, for you, but, but where was most of your experience before? I, I was a .NET developer like me. It means I, I write codes and I deploy, but a cloud uh, provided people with different solutions than uh, like what, what we call in the, in the ticket company, the plumbing issues, like the hosting and providing uh, several solutions that you don't have to em employ a lot of people to take care of. And my, my job was is to write code and write solutions. By using Azure, there is already existing platforms. You can use uh, uh, tools and you don't have to know anything about the cloud or the coding to uh, provide a, a tech solutions for your problems. So I, I, I learned how to utilize uh, these uh, existing platforms and tools to uh, provide solutions. Gotcha. Uh, well, that, and, and I and I assume that your, you know, while you didn't have specific experiences beforehand you know, your tech background, you know, and coding, was that, did that make things easier to? Yes. Before I joined Microsoft, I, I used to write everything by my hands. Like if I, I need, a, 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 if I need a tool, I need to create it by by myself, write the code for that tool. But now I, I know there's a tool. I don't have to reinvent the wheel to, uh, to do that, to the same job, to do the same job. Oh, cool. Well, that's good. Not having to reinvent the wheel uh, when it comes to coding. Well, well thank yeah. you. Um, and Elvira, um, yeah, again, love to hear how you grew professionally um, or are growing. Thank you, Zach. Still are um, uh, serving in the United States. <laughs> well, that is very interesting. And I'll say I have not experienced as much growth as I have just in the past like 18 months or so. And um, if I had to focus on tech growth right now, I'll say my back end skills, especially in Python, improved a lot because of the project I worked in and even having to teach a Python class to which I had to like, you know, take some training in uh, because before I had, you know, pretty good, uh, or I was very comfortable as a front end developer and everything front end, but I was still a bit shy you know, working on anything back end, but because of the mm -hmm. nature of the things that I had to do, I had to like basically up my game. And um, that was uh, also very easy to to, to do because uh, my organization has uh, paid for us or sponsors us to take trainings on uh, various platforms like Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, and even Salesforce. So uh, that I can say has been very good. And another thing is um, I have gotten an opportunity to interact with so many people uh, because of you know working with different teams, not just like at my organization, but also with the other Atlas fellows. And you know everyone brings in so much expertise and uh, life experiences, and you'd be surprised of just how much you can learn. And that just tells you how intentional Atlas is about like getting you into a professional, uh, into a diverse and professional setup. And so I also have to mention that my writing skills improved a lot by contributing to the Atlas Co blogs and um, maybe speaking during the global leadership training forums. So yeah, that has been very, very positive. Oh, that, that's amazing to hear. And now you talked about um, front end and back end development. Are you doing both during the fellowship? And it's just, it was a matter of becoming more comfortable with um, the back end of, side of things? Yes, so I do both because uh, when you're teaching, like if you're teaching the software engineering, you have to show them both sides. I mean, eventually, you know, in the, prof in the real professional setup, someone, uh, doesn't have to do all the work. 
you know, they <laughs> always there are always teams for different things. But it's also important for them to understand that, you know, this is what happens here and this is what happens on this other side. You can use JavaScript to do this, you can use React to do this, you can use Python or these uh, whatever for the database and all that. So for you as an instructor, you must know that for you to share with or teach others. Great. Um, there's actually a question from the audience um, that we'll go ahead and answer. It was, do you have to come up with an initiative at the time of your application or just share which social issues you're passionate about and Atlas Core will match you with an organization? Um, I'll go ahead and answer this. Um, you do not have to come up with an initiative at the time of application. Um, uh, the host organizations already have a set um, goal for your fellowship. Um, and of course, you um, work with your supervisor to develop a training plan to develop the specific learning outcomes from uh, your general responsibilities. Um, and that training plan um, helps uh, the host organization and yourself stay focused on your professional development and what you'd like to uh, learn. Um, and then and there was another question about the age restriction. Um, and yes, the, the age restriction is 35 and it is, um, it is set in stone at, at being 35 when you start the fellowship. All right, amazing. Um, so my next question um, for our panelists here are, you know, how has the fellowship enabled you to promote initiatives you care about from back home, either during or after your fellowship? Uh, me and a previous Atlas Core fellow tried to start an uh, additional inclusion, inclusion uh, initiative with partner with Airband team, but it's difficult in Palestine. So uh, we didn't give up yet, but it's it's difficult. We still we still trying. Uh, and also, uh, I'm working with Ikitabu, the organization I mentioned before. They, they, uh, I don't work actually with with this with the same uh, branch with them, but I I I, I am part of uh, their mission is to deliver ebooks to uh, to to people and children in in Africa, and and I, I like that uh, mission, and I'm working with them to achieve that. Great, and and tell me more about this Airband in, initiative partnership um, with the other fellows. What were some of the challenges with that? It's political uh, issues like, because uh, Airband using technologies are not allowed in, in my country. Hmm. Yes, that is quite an obstacle yeah. to overcome when the, yeah. it's not um, permitted. Uh, well, thank thank you for giving me me insight into into that though. Um, and then Elvira, how how about you? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I I do not want to let the cat out of the bag, but I'll just give a hint. Um, I am in the process of, uh, I'm working with a friend, but you're in the process of delivering a fully functional website for one of the schools that we attended in Kenya because it doesn't have one. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I am also currently a tech mentor for women in, uh, in tech initiative in Kenya. So although it's also global, it has like, um, you know, many young women or just, uh, even, you know, women in tech uh, across Africa. And we you know we virtually have the sessions like uh, twice a month. So because of all these, uh, you know, logistics, but I've also made uh, useful connections with colleagues who have a background in finance to advise on budgeting and even developing funding proposals for nonprofits uh, because, um, I'm planning to resuscitate a uh, dormant youth uh, development project in sports in Kenya. It's my own startup. And uh, the dormancy has been because of uh, limited funds. So fundraising skills uh, and, you know, will always 
come in handy when I go back. I didn't realize that until I tried uh, a fundraising for masks for a local school in Kenya. And, you know, with the help of one of the fellows who has very good fundraising skills and language, that went very successful. So now I'm pretty confident about uh, venturing out more when I get back home. Oh wow, that that's amazing! So you uh, you partnered with another fella to to do this fundraising. <laughs> yeah, it was more of like he helped me, you know, uh, the language with the language to like attract funding. So <laughs> cool, that's great. Uh, well, that's just maybe the... she'll give a shout out to Pratush. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Uh, cool. Well, shout out to him. And that just uh, demonstrates the the beautiful aspect of the Atlas Core Network. Um, and, you know, both of you have, you know, have worked with other fellows to um, promote, you know, social good when it comes to tech. So really great to hear, the, you know, the initiatives that both of you have been uh, working on. Uh, oh, man, Elvira, you have a lot going on, which is great. Um, you did mention... Um, uh, you know, women in tech um, and being a being a mentor. What is that like? You know, back home. It's it's been a very interesting journey because uh, when I started out as a person, uh, as a someone or a woman who pursued a degree in IT, and by the time I graduated, I pretty much didn't know anything about the market. I did not know what to expect. I didn't know. I was just I didn't know anything. I was. Uh, both ignorant and just not aware <laughs> of even where to get the information. So having someone to hold your hand somehow to guide you through, because like right now I'm working with six girls and um, two graduated recently, but the others are still in university. But I try to just help them from the basics, such as like having your own GitHub or just setting up a portfolio so that by the time you start looking for work out there, you have something it's something that i did not have before and it really was a disadvantage i'll say professionally because when you go for an interview and someone else presents this whole portfolio of projects they're working on and you have like nothing then it sets you really far aside or apart in the competition game so uh i feel honored and i feel good every day when uh my mentees um you know, report progress in the way they are maybe even performing in school or just uh, venturing out professionally. That's awesome. What well, well, great to hear about your your own experience and how you're helping others um, become successful in the tech field. <laughs> great. Um, well, my last question um, for for both of you um, are. Um, what is some advice that you can give to tech and engineering candidates about the application process? Uh, you need to apply. Without applying, you cannot get the fellowship. Go ahead and apply. <laughs> also, maybe you, you think what well, I'm going to learn in for the tech fellows, like I can learn the technology at home, but you will be amazed how, how much you can learn. Also, the amount of network you will build from Atlas Core and from the uh, from the organization you will be uh, you will be ho your host or you'll be serving at, and uh, also you will broaden your perspective in life and in technology by applying to Atlas Core and serving at one of the organizations. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Great question, Zach, and I will not repeat, I'll do my best not to repeat what Karam has said. And I think what I would say is I think it's uh, it's wise to make sure your application aligns with your morals. And that is where the meta work comes in, because after the application, the interviews and hiring process will begin. And um, a good job in tech, uh, entirely depends on your priorities so at some point in the process there is going to be a focus on role related knowledge and cognitive ability 
and uh, most software engineering and uh, data analyst positions, for example, data science, will have hands-on coding interviews uh, or take home projects. Uh, but you know, don't freak out; they are very doable. So, um, role-related questions will depend on how technical the role is. For example, if you're targeting full-stack developer roles. Um, you will be tested heavily on coding skills. And the role I work in, as I mentioned earlier, is more front end. So it's uh, it's less coding, I'll say, compared to someone who is doing more software development or web development projects at Google. And uh, you should be ready to demonstrate at least intermediate skills with any language that you put on your resume. And uh, that goes to stuff like, for example, SQL. You know, there could be joins, aggregations, or arrays. And you may also be asked straightforward questions like, how do you do X? You know, those type of questions to test your basic knowledge of a language. Well, you know, prepare for that. Um, I would also prepare for situational questions in which you have to apply that knowledge or code on the spot. So you may be asked to show uh, any previous projects that you've worked on. And this is where you get your GitHub and portfolio ready. And so to conclude, I would say, don't forget to prepare for normal interview questions and focus on uh, demonstrating a solid set of experiences that you could apply to do a lot of different questions and a parting shot is to have an open mind and don't stop showing up. Keep your head high because you've got all it takes. Awesome. Um, Althea, you did mention um, GitHub um, as, as, and getting your portfolio ready. Could you uh, be, uh, go a little bit more into that detail about GitHub? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So GitHub is, uh, I'll say it's like uh, an open source bank in a layman's language <laughs> or community rather. So here people, um, you know, I, I can do, I can have my code or my set of projects that I work on and projects, I don't mean like complicated projects. It could be as simple as uh, designing a calculator or developing a calculator or, um, maybe a delivery app or something, but you share your code out there. So sometimes when someone is working on something, they might want to reference or they might want to borrow your, you know, your code. So they come there and uh, they can request, you know, you have like push or pull requests that happens there. So, hey, Zach, please, can I use your code here? Or can I, you know, refer to your code? That's kind of thing. So, that is, uh, it's, it's, it's also useful like as a developer because it helps you to control what you're working on. We, 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 the, the right terminology is version control. And uh, so it lets you work on your projects from anywhere and everywhere. You know, like the way Google Drive works, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So that is the Google Drive for uh, developers. So if I have my project, I can log in anywhere and whenever and work on it. And someone can, else can also like, you know, collaborate there in a way. Awesome. Kram, do you have a GitHub? <laughs> of course. Of course yeah. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, thank you uh, for giving giving insight into that. Um, and yeah, for your advice around applying for the fellowship. Um, it fits in nicely with um, what we'll talk about next, um, which is the application process and more tips for having a good application. In the meantime, if you have any questions for um, uh, Elvira Karam, feel free to put it in the chat or any general questions about the fellowship while I go through um, application tips. Um, so first, a little bit about the application process. Um, it's a multi-step process. 
Um, and the first step, as Karam had mentioned, is to just apply, fill out an application. <laughs> uh, the application requires a copy of your undergraduate transcript or diploma. And we do ask for two references, although you do not need to have them submitted by our priority deadline, which is uh, May 16th. Um, attaching a resume or CV is also encouraged, and you may be asked to submit samples of your work to provide evidence of your professional skills. Uh, so as we were just discussing, GitHub would be the perfect thing to, to include in your application to demonstrate those uh, coding skills and skills in tech and engineering. Uh, so how can you make sure to, uh, so yeah, then going after that, once your application passes the review, you may be invited to an Atlas Core Skype interview. And uh, if you pass the interview, you'll be considered a semi-finalist for placement at a host organization. And being considered a semi-finalist does not mean you will necessarily become a fellow. It means that you'll be in a pool um, of, of qualified candidates. And we want to make sure that we, when we find a host organization, that we find a fellow who matches the profile and he'll take a lot away from the learning experience. So that's how we identify you for the fellowship after you become the, the semi-finalist. Uh, so you're considered for potential placement um, and you would mark your availability every couple of months. Um, and re reaffirm your interest in the fellowship when you're semi-finalist. Um, and again, that priority application deadline for this cycle is May 16th, 2021. Um, so now how can you make sure to have a good application? Well, I, something that uh, you know we're emphasizing in this webinar is skill set. Each skill that you select on your application has its own set of follow-up questions to dive deeper into your experience. Uh, please answer these questions thoroughly as using statistics and keywords in our and your response will ensure that your application is matched with appropriate roles. If technology and engineering is your primary skill, then you should mark this as skill one on your application. The skill should also be what you're looking to further develop during your Alice Core Fellowship. The most successful candidates demonstrate their expertise in a specific skill set throughout the entire application and provide ample information about their professional experience with concrete examples that communicate their accomplishments. Uh, for example, um, you know, if you're an expert in IT, then this professional experience should be highlighted in your application essays, biographies, resume, and work samples that you submit um, so that you can show everyone that you are an expert in, in IT when they look at your application. If, you're if your application does not demonstrate at least two years of experience in a specific skill area, then it's unlikely that it will be uh, successful. Um, so make sure when you're filling out every section, especially the employment history section, that you are demonstrating that two years of experience in a specific skill. In terms of uh, eligibility, uh, general eligibility, uh, you must have a bachelor's degree, be proficient in English, have two to 10 years of experience is what we typically recommend, um, and a, a minimum of two years, uh, be age 35 or under, and uh, be committed to returning to your home country or region at the end of your fellowship and to living on a basic living stipend. Uh, while valuable professions, we do not place applicants who have most of their work experience in teaching, translating, or the law. Uh, before you're prompted to fill out an application, you will have the opportunity to take a short eligibility quiz, and that will help you determine whether you should apply. In terms of English, which I mentioned before, um, you want your application to be clear and concise and have a friend who speaks English um, as your native language to read over your application. Even if English is your, your native language, it's always good to have um, someone else read over it. And then the bio that you fill out, um, it's really important to, to write a really strong bio. This is your first essay question. So this is what we'll use um, to send to potential host organizations where you'd be um, placed as a fellow. Um, so definitely spend time on writing that bio in third person. 
um, it could eliminate you from consideration if you you just don't uh, write a good bio and everything else about you seems great. Um, and when you're writing your bio and just for your entire application, you really want to think how you can sell yourself. If you had 30 seconds to convince a host organization to accept you, what would you want them to know about you? So those are some tips for uh, how to apply to the fellowship. Uh, again, we're happy to take questions from viewers. Um, so feel free to post questions in the comment section and we can get to um, any, any questions that you may have. Well, here, here is one question. How does the COVID-19 outbreak affect Atlas for applicants and semifinalists? Um, so Atlas Court is currently accepting and reviewing applicants, uh, applications from all countries outside of the US for our in-person fellowship in the United States. Uh, we expect that most or all of our fellows will be placed into this program um, for the full 12 month fellowship in the US. As the vaccine becomes widely available in the country and the rate of COVID um, is lower, um, we do anticipate being able to bring fellows to the U.S. safely. And you send your question just by writing a comment um, below the webinar. That is how you um, send your question right on the, the wall <laughs> of Facebook. Um, additionally, for COVID-19, if it is not possible to bring individual fellows to the U.S. in 2021 due to travel, visa, or safety guidelines, we will discuss alternative program options with those fellows individually, which may include our blended fellowship, which combines remote service with in-person service. Um, Alvaro and Karam, I have another question for you. What, what fun cultural activities did you do, um, have you done during your fellowship? Um, not only is this a professional development opportunity, but this is also an opportunity to get to know the U.S. and to get to know other cultures. So I'd love to hear a little bit of that from you. <laughs> um, I, I lived in Seattle, and Seattle is a green, a green city. So hiking is the number one activity uh, I did in, in Washington State. I used to go hiking every, every weekend. Hiking, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. And, and what, what was a cool um, place you went hiking? Uh, this Mount Baker and there's uh, Cougar Mountain as well. There's a lot of, uh, you, you cannot r run out of places to hike in Seattle and Washington State. And oh, you okay. That, that's awesome. <laughs> Plenty of hiking is what I hear. Yeah. I've never been there, but sounds like a lot of fun. And how about you there? You're in a very different, all the way in New York, very different environment, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's New York. First of all, <laughs> there is something for everyone. And uh, of course, um, most of the times I always play tennis or go biking. I go biking around my neighborhood or uh, to Central Park. And um, when I'm not doing that, I have been crisscrossing uh, the US, you know, to several other states, uh, frequenting Washington DC because of uh, my interest there, <laughs> like to just to hang out with other fellows basically. And uh, visiting the nearby states like Virginia, where there's also, you know, nice spots for hiking, uh, going for crab soup at Annapolis <laughs> in Maryland. And I also went to Texas and uh, in Texas, I don't know how to say this, but Texas is just Texas, especially when you come from New York. <laughs> First of all, it's so huge. Everything is big. Uh, I try to say that even the graveyard, you have a very big graveyard. So <laughs> it's really interesting. And of course, another interesting thing that I did here is I went skiing upstate because, um, you know, they're like nice skiing, uh, you know, sports there. And uh, right now, the one thing that is on my bucket list is Niagara Falls. So 
which I am uh, planning to go maybe the next coming, uh, the coming weekend or so. Hopefully the weather will allow. But yeah, there's, there's just a lot of stuff. And the community also, uh, like in my community, so there's like a food, uh, is it called a food pantry? And so sometimes I volunteer there. Like it's not consistent, but I try to check in uh, at least once or twice a week for like an hour or two, just packing food. Sometimes when I have time, I help them to deliver food. To a few places but you know with also COVID you try to limit just being out there as much as you can so mm -hmm. yeah I, I do I, I do that and a whole lot of other things <laughs> well that's fun I've never been to Annapolis or Texas um, so that those are really cool experiences <laughs> amazing uh well we had uh we actually have a semi-finalist um on this live uh webinar with us um and the questions around when should they expect the next result or when is the next cohort starting um so the next cohorts are in july october and january um for the atlas core fellowship um, so again, for semi finalist, um, I encourage you to, um, you know, each time we email you instructions um, to mark your availability for the next um, cohort when it's starting to click yes, um, so that you are actively considered for, for the fellowship as we partner with different host organizations who may fit your, your profile. So again, usually these instructions include um, updating your availability, uh, which you, again, you do every two, two to four months, um, and even updating your application with any new or relevant information to ensure that your application continues to uh, demonstrate your growing expertise in a certain skill area. Uh, we continually reassess semifinalists to determine if they're still being considered for future fellowship placements. Um, and in some cases, Atlas Core may go back to semi, uh, semi finalists to ask for additional information or another interview. Um, yeah, so again, um, you can be in the semi finalist pool for a while. Um, and in that, in that case, I do encourage you to uh, take another look at your your application and make sure that you know if, if that all of your experience is there um, and profile is updated so that you receive the, the fullest consideration for your fellowship but again it does depend on on the host organizations we partner with and and we really want to make sure that the fellows have the profile that match that great well then in closing um, we're going to start reviewing applications soon so apply early. As um, Alvir and Karam have mentioned, um, you know, it's a competitive application process. There's a lot you need to do uh, to, um, you know, you should ensure to have a competitive application, but the first step is just applying. <laughs> um, this is one of several webinars that we've done throughout April and May. We have one more next week on monitoring and evaluation. Um, and you can find all of our websites, uh, all of our webinars on our website, events.atlascore.org. Um, you can also visit apply.atlascore.org for more information about the fellowship um, and any special opportunities for professionals in engineering and tech. Um, I loved hearing about both of your experiences today. Um, Elvira and Karam, it is really insightful to see how you're using uh, your data, tech, and engineering skills for good. Um, and yeah, just just loved you know just hearing and talking with you today. Um, we do look forward to reading your applications, and if you have questions, um, you can email applyatlascore.org with the subject line "question from webinar participant." Um, I actually do see a couple more questions that we'll go ahead and answer quickly before closing. Um, so one of them is if it's possible to submit your application 
uh, first time after the submission to update it and send next time to the same session within the fellowship program. Uh, if you do submit your application again, uh, I recommend, uh, I, you know, if, if we haven't reviewed it or I'm not sure if we have reviewed it, um, go ahead and, and update it, um, you know, with new experiences. And then our second question was, if there's a specific NGO you'd like to work with um, and how you can use um, your relationship with that organization for your advantage with Atlas Core. Uh, so applicants do not apply to a specific host organization, but rather an opportunity to be placed at one of our partner organizations. Um, matching semifinalist is a multi-step process and um, really involves um, specific steps. Um, you can indicate in your application which organization interests you, but we can't guarantee placement at any particular organization. And in many cases, those organizations may be looking for a specific candidate profile. Um, again, you shouldn't contact potential or current host organizations unless they've been contacted from the host organizations first. Um, and this may jeopardize your candidacy because Atlas Core is best equipped to discuss the logistics of hosting a fellow. Um, if you do work with an organization based in the U.S. and would like us to send a U.S.-based staff member information on hosting a fellow, um, you can go ahead and send us their contact information uh, of that, that U.S. staff member to apply at atlascore.org, um, but don't contact them yourself about hosting you. Um, because again, Atlas Core is best equipped to discuss the commitment that a host organization makes when, when hosting a fellow. Um, and yes, you can update your profile anytime, even after the update uh, deadline. All righty. Well, again, thank you so much, everyone, for um, your time today. And, and thank you to our uh, viewers. Uh, we are excited to get your application um, and review it. I hope everyone has um, a fantastic uh, rest of their day or evening. And uh, yeah, again, reach out to us with any questions. Thank you, everyone.